They're kind of famous for refusing some pretty key, you know, some pretty big opportunities. Indeed, I have. You know, and, and you just told us about one of them, and we've talked about a few others that, you know, definitely seem like they, in retrospect, they were the, exactly the right things to do. I mean, do you have any regrets? Is None. there one that you're... Um, Toto, a little bit. I, I kind of think maybe I should have taken Jeff and David up on mm -hmm. the offer to join Toto. Um, other than that, no. Um, I was asked to be musical director for the Blues Brothers. Uh, I thought that it would lead to some form of harm, mm. and it did to John, you know. So, mm. um, ultimately, I don't feel that I made the wrong decision. Yeah. Um, yeah, yeah, you were it, you were pretty close to. Yeah, yeah, John very too, right? Very. Mm. Yeah. Um, life comes with all these, you know, choices yeah. and sometimes conflicting opportunities. And you can only take your best guess. Um, it's a double-edged sword. It is. It is indeed. Not to harp on Steely Dan, but I think, you know, for better or worse, that's what a lot of people associate you with. Um, it always comes up, yeah. Um, you know, and I think we know what your most famous work with Steely Dan is. What's your, what's your favorite work that you did with Steely Dan? Oh, my favorite work would be... Um, several obscure ones, Kings. The thing I love about that solo is that, first of all, it was a weird song. Mm. had strange changes, yeah. it had strange subject matter, but I was in the middle of life turmoil. I was going mm. through a divorce from a, you know, a, a young marriage that I really should never have gotten into, mm. so I was bananas. And I got a chance to play out my mm. bananasness on on that thing. You know, and you also from, got a chance to pick your app. Yeah, well, yeah. <laughs> uh, but, it, you know, I, I remember doing some some regular rock stuff and then all of a sudden going into like a whole tone descending. And so I got a chance to be schizophrenic on a record. Which was fun. And it's I learned record. that... Well, you know, I mean, what it taught me was that let it all hang out. Mm. Worst comes to worst, it'll be a solo that doesn't work. Mm. Best comes to best, it's like people go, where did that come from? Yeah, yeah. So, and I love the idea of not being ordinary. Um, how can you take some, un unless the remit of the record is to sound absolutely ordinary. Mm. But the idea of taking chances, making an adventure out of the whole mm. scene, that's, that's the stuff. Yeah. Yeah, that's, yeah, I mean... Well, I mean, yeah, a lot of those, the most beloved pieces of work are the spontaneous ones. I mean, even, you know, the famous one, Really in the Years, yeah, yeah. that was, what, one take? I it mean, was one take, take yeah. or, or, Well, no, I've heard actually the, the first take went unrecorded. The first take was unrecorded. And it was supposedly better, right? I mean, that's we what all they thought, say. Yeah, yeah, that's what we all thought. But the second one was pretty good. Yeah, it's not bad. I'll uh, take it. And for those who are interested in... Was it a lot different, the first take? I mean, do you even really remember what the first take was? Or I have just kind no of idea. faded into legend? And the other Steely Dan tune that I think is really, to me, is outstanding uh, was a tune called Sign and Stranger. Mm. And the reason I really like it is because with the strange words that Donald came up with, um, there's, a, there's a sort of a background dialogue going on between mm. the piano and the guitar. Yeah, would you like to take a yo-yo for yeah. a ride? Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You know, and, and and Paul's playing all these really magical keyboard things. And it was, again, it was very spontaneous. It was spur of the moment. You know, Royal Scam in particular, you're credited, but there's not a lot of specifics about what you did. I've been listening to that going... Well, that's very, that's trying very, to figure out what you played, and I, I was yeah. pretty sure that that was you on Sign and Stranger. Yeah, well, the lack of specifics is very Donald and Walter. Yeah. 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 I did a record for Vicky Sue Robinson once called Turn the Beat Around, mm. which was later covered by Miami Sound Machine. Mm -hmm. And I used this really slow phaser. The entire part was doing this. Mm. Not playing a single tonal note. Mm -hmm but being the, another piece of the percussion. Sure, yeah. What's something that you've played on that people might not realize 
is you. I mean, what's what's kind of the most well-known piece of work <sighs> that you're kind of a, an unknown part of? Well, I guess a lot of people don't know that I did the soundtrack for the movie Fame. Yep. Da -da 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 -da. Mm -hmm. That and the accompanying solos. Mm -hmm. That did very well for me. I still mm -hmm. get royalty checks. Um, mm -hmm. What else? Good work if you can get it, right? Yeah, yeah. I mean, an awful lot of the work. Warriors. Like, Warriors was a great. Oh, oh that was a wonderful movie. Yeah. Which is still, you know, kind of had a resurgence. I think it was kind of. Uh, you know, kind of got forgotten yeah, for it's, some it's time, become, and it's it's come back. It's become a real cult. Yeah, yeah it's a great movie, though. It's, it is. It is. Yeah, and it. the music's very lively. Yeah. Really, really lively. Um, you know, I, I try and do as many interesting kind of jobs. Mm. That's I call them jobs. You know, mm. I don't mean jobs as opposed to gigs. I mean mm. projects, things mm. that are really fun. Sure. Um, I was involved in the Doors movie. Oh him. yeah, what did you do in that? I coached Frank Whaley to play guitar. Oh cool. So it was very interesting. Mm -hmm. You know, we spent several months with him coming to my studio and mm -hmm. I'd show him, you know, ways to appear to be a guitar player. Mm -hmm. uh, I actually started teaching teaching a bit of guitar, mm -hmm. um, which was even better. Mm -hmm. um, but then I wound up going out to Hollywood for a couple of weeks and being around the set and mm -hmm. kind of enjoying how movie making work, sure, yeah. which is very different to a lot of other music related projects. Yeah. Yeah. What's, what's your favorite uh, kind of band music related movie? Nashville. I don't know. Oh, the show. The show the, Nashville? The, the movie. Oh, I, I'm not yeah, familiar with Robert that. Altman How old is this back in the 70s. Okay. Yeah, I'm not and, familiar with Oh boy, tear your heart out. Mm. And, and then, of course, you know, for a piece of musical history, The Last Waltz, the band, yeah. I mean, that's, that's a real piece of, yeah. of music documentary. Yeah. And mm -hmm. I, was, I was quite friendly with, well, before they became the band, they were Levon and the Hawks, mm. uh, having just finished backing up Ronnie Hawk and Sure, yeah. Yeah, I read Levon's biography. Yeah. Uh, so we played the entire summer of 65. Mm. Uh, on the Jersey Shore. Oh, with Jay and the Americans and No, this is my own band. This is this is uh, just a little quartet, mm -hmm. you know. Uh, what we, Elliot Randall and the Escorts. Was, uh, <laughs> sorry about that. A few ways. <laughs> yeah. Um, and uh, these guys were playing opposite us. Wow. Talk about in the same club or same just club. The, same club. Like the, swap the club had like, no, they had three bars. And yeah. each band was up on a bandstand. Oh, I think I read about that. Bus. I gotta go back and look if they mentioned you. In yeah, it's fantastic. I don't remember if they did or not. I did have a funny <laughs> Robbie Robertson <laughs> story though for you. <laughs> Robbie was the guitar player with the band, and um, I was a bit shy, and he was a bit shy. And I remember going over and I'll make a little small talk. <laughs> so Robbie, how often do you change your strings? And he looked at me with a complete straight face, mm. and didn't miss a beat, and went, "When I break one." Mm -hmm. <laughs> That's true. You know, Hendrix, um, mm -hmm. Page. Yeah. Um, I mean, you were peers yeah, yeah, with yeah. these guys in real time when it was happening, right? I mean, yeah. what what did you get? What did you get from those guys? I mean, did you get anything from Jimmy? Is there anything specific? Did you teach anything to Jimmy? Did he get anything from you? No, we did both. We, think, Jimmy sure? and I both shared a love of Curtis Mayfield. Oh, cool. And if you listen to a lot of Jimmy's stuff, and probably a lot of my stuff as well, mm. you'll hear Curtis Mayfield, you know, coming through laughing, you know, mm. once or twice a tune. He was so plugged in musically, harmonically, spiritually. Yeah, yeah. It was really just all there. Well, and I heard you doing some stuff earlier, like kind of, uh, you know, I'm not even sure what the right term for it is, but kind of arpeggiating off of the chord forms kind of thing that Jimmy did a lot. And when I... For me, that was really a personal revelation that really mm. opened up my playing a lot when I figured that out. Yeah. I mean, yeah. is that, did that come from Curtis Mayfield? Absolutely. Absolutely. A hundred percent. Yeah. Cool. And who knows who Curtis got it from? Sure. Yeah. It's right. funny because when I... from the best, right? Yeah. yeah. Well, well best, absolutely. Yeah. One of Jimmy's, you know, number one traits was understanding, not on a technical level, but on a spiritual level, for lack of a better Visceral word. Visceral level. Yeah, certainly, mm. yeah. 
he he knew how to combine oscillations. Mm. He could he knew that if he made a certain note feedback, mm. he could play with that note by the proximity factor. Mm. Wherever he was in relation to the speakers, if he brought it closer, mm. it would be stronger. If he tilted it one way or another, it might actually change the overriding principal harmonic. Mm. So he could go from a tonic to a fifth, but if he went another way, it might go to like a completely different, yeah, yeah, yeah. you know, uh, uh, a seventh, or, mm. or you know, or or, or or even you name it. It, mm. it, it would just go there because of the way yeah, yeah. he was moving the parts. Yeah. And of course, guitars weren't meant; they weren't designed to do that. So it, what it meant is that he was taking it to a whole other level. Mm. He was taking the design and then co-opting that design to get mm. the sounds that he wanted. You know, certainly Hendrix was a pivotal moment, like a watershed oh, kind of guy. I mean, what, what do you see as, as the most significant events in um, guitar history, rock music history? Oh, that's, that's interesting. It, it, it would have to do with styles, mm. with um, stylistic approaches mm. to the guitar. You know, you get the conventional approach, which mm. is fingers, a pick or your fingers on the right hand or on the, on the picking hand um, through to people using strange devices like, uh, what's that little guy? That Ebo? Ebo, yeah. yeah. Which, when used creatively, can come out with some really mm. fantastic stuff. Um, at the same time, you've got the slide. Mm. You know, I think somebody like Ry Cooter, when mm. I heard Ry Cooter, I went, oh. Do you play much slide? I don't know if I can think of you. Not enough. I think I've heard that you play not enough. slide. You talked about lap steel. Do you, do you play lap steel? Not really at all. Yeah. Not really. I mean, the guitar has, has really been the one mm. six-string instrument that I really play. Or, sure. You know, multi-string instrument that I play well. Mm. Um, I play a little bit of bass, but mm. the, the focus is on a little bit. Mm. Um, do you play piano at all? Very badly. Mm. I love synthesis. I love. Yeah, I, I don't know. <laughs> I love. I love working with oscillators and yeah. to see how oscillators can be used to affect each other. Sure. Using different waveforms. Um, you know, having having an oscillator work as a low frequency oscillator, mm. having, having others work as frequency controls. Mm. You know, for Q and it, it's just mm. there's no limit. You mm. know, it's. Uh, I mean, I'm, I'm one of the original guys who said, hmm, why don't we try using brushes on a telephone book? Let's see mm. what that sounds like, mm. you know, when it comes to production. It's like you're, you're limited only by your imagination. That gets me to that question I was going to ask. Mm. It was a real specific question, and I heard this sound on, uh, pretty sure it's on Randall's Island, mm -hmm. that sounds like birds chirping, and it sounds like something Hendrix did on Electric Ladyland. I'm pretty sure it was Electric Ladyland. Is, did you funny enough, get that from him? And how do you do that? Funny enough, it wasn't. Is me. it a guitar? No, it was. It was a flute. Oh, okay. It was. My, do you know how Jimmy did it? Because it sounds. It sounds like that chirp bird chirping thing that he does. No, but I could guess. I mm. mean, I would imagine he. I, obviously, he'd be way up on the high mm. strings, and you know, whatever combination of volume control, mm. tone control. And echoes that he was using mm -hmm. would have would have caused that. Maybe something uh, Eddie Kramer was doing. Eddie was Eddie, Eddie was a total is a total creative genius. Have I mean, you worked with the, him in the studio? I imagine Eddie you. and I co-produced my first album. Okay, we did Randall's Island together. Oh, okay, good. And and he was loads of fun to work. I with. guess I should have read the credits. I didn't do That's all of that cramming. <laughs> That's some homework yeah. assignments. No, Eddie was wonderful, mm -hmm. and it was. I, I got a lot of support from Jimmy when we did that first record as well, because mm. huh. you know he'd be coming into the studio and we'd chat. And we'd oh, you did it in that. Electric Lady. Right? Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. Wow. So, a really good experience. Mm. Crazy. Almost <laughs> all the studios that we all grew up playing in are gone now, mm. and it's an interesting testament to see that Electric Lady is still there. Mm. It, it, it's it's great, absolutely great. Mm. Because it was a seminal place. Yeah. There's ghosts coming out of the walls. Oh, yeah. I mean, to me, when I talk about a studio, it's like no matter how new and well-equipped the place is, 
it's all about the vibe. Yeah. I've been to some unbelievable looking studios that, even though they can put out really great sounding project, they feel sterile. Mm. And to me, I'd rather it be a little on the funky side. Yeah. So, uh, you've been living in London for how long now? 30 years. Oh, wow. Um, mm -hmm. Have you, uh, speaking of, of uh, these, you know, kind of seminal studio facilities, have you have you recorded at uh, Abbey Road? Mm -hmm. uh, I mean, a lot? Or what, what have you done? At Enough. The, uh, I mean, it, it's a great studio. Mm -hmm. It's a really, really good studio. It's well maintained. They have, it's the most ex one of the most expensive studios in the world, so mm -hmm. they're actually able to have a team of technicians mm -hmm. and uh, you know, and everything works. Have they loosened up a little bit since the white coat days, or? Oh yeah, Is absolutely, <laughs> absolutely. They have. How about Olympic? Have you recorded at Olympic? Is Olympic still there? Olympic's not there anymore. Oh really? Sadly, mm. that went the way of a lot. Of, it went. Sarm is gone as mm. well. Trevor Horn's place. Mm. Beautiful old studio. Mm. In fact, Sarm before it was Sarm was Island Records, mm. and Bob Marley had his little apartment at the back there. Mm. So I used to do a bit of hanging out in those days. Oh, well. cool. Really great. Mm, I bet, yeah. Well, but, you know, Bob Marley has a uh, Wilmington, Delaware connection, too. Yeah, uh, it's a lot of people don't really know about, but that was the first place, uh, I'm pretty sure it's the first place he lived outside of uh, Jamaica. Wow. It was in Wilmington, That's Delaware. Yeah. Yeah, yeah he, was, he, he was something else. Mm. Walter had a very strong reggae influence. In fact, oh, yeah. Uh, I like circus money a lot, and uh, you know that's like half, good half of it's a reggae, reggae record, pretty yep. much. Yeah, absolutely. Mm. And then uh, what's the one? Uh, Haitian divorce, very reggae. And uh, do you know who played the voice box? Is that him playing the voice box solo? Actually, Larry divorce? played the Larry played the guitar, and Donald did the voice box. Mm. Oh, really? Yeah. So it was a keyboard. Or was it? No, it was the, it oh, was, oh, yeah. oh, he, oh, 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 oh. And there was, he, he, had, he had the, the voice box. Wow. I've actually got one of the original voice boxes That's that cool. was made in Nashville huh. back in the 50s. Yeah. Basically a great big heavy ass driver. Yeah. And a piece of tubing. Yeah. That was it. Mm. Joe Walsh. Well, I tell you, my two, fa my two favorite um, voice box guys are, would be Joe mm. and Peter Frampton. Yeah, Frampton. Well, he's, you know, probably more than anybody else made it. Wasn't the first, but one of the no, no, most I, notable. Yeah, oh yeah. Mm -hmm. I mean, a lot of the firsts actually came out of Nashville. Mm. Fuzz supposedly came out mm. of Nashville. Jeff Beck was pretty early. Yeah. Voice box. Yep. User. You know, musicians of, of my generation, especially, and you know, me personally, I tend to think of things in terms of, uh, you know, kind of benchmarks. You know, the Beatles, the Beatles is, is like one of those kind of, benchmark moments mm -hmm. and you know especially uh, a lot of the, the stuff I grew up on the the 70s rock I mean mm -hmm. you hear those guys talk almost to a person they point to the Beatles appearance on the Ed Sullivan show mm -hmm. as that kind of aha moment where they're like I want to do that yeah yeah I mean what was it for you was there one thing that you said I want to do that. That's, there, that's there were, cool. Funny enough, there were dozens. Um, growing up watching TV. Well, and obviously it was uh, pre-Beatles, because well, you were already that's tired. Right, that's right. Yeah. Um, but, you know, they had all those Western shows, and the mm -hmm. Western shows had all these twangy guitars, mm -hmm. which were a lot of Tommy Tedesco and a couple yeah, of yeah. guys. Um, and Did you end up knowing Tommy at all in your... Uh, yeah, we, yeah, later on, I mean, yeah. way, way yeah. later on, toward the end of his career, actually. Uh, funny guy, really funny guy. But um, aside from those, there was a show called the Lawrence Welk Show. Yeah. And they had two really, really, really great yeah. guitar players, mm. um, Neil Levang and the other name will come back to me. Mm. We'll put it up as a mm -hmm. subtitle. Sure. Yeah. yeah. Um, but yeah, they were they were playing some unbelievably hip stuff. Mm. And then the Beatles came out mm. and just uh, reinforced it, probably. Yeah. Yeah. It's but like, around, yeah, I'm on the right track. Absolutely. Those guys got it. Mm. Yeah. But within a couple of years of that, I was also listening to, I was never really a jazzer. I wasn't a mm. bebopper. I still am, aren't. Because it's a lifetime study. Um, having said that, I, I listened to a lot of Jimmy Smith. 
mm. and Kenny Burrell was his guitar player, which was fantastic. Mm. Um, but in terms of the growing up and you know the things that made me go boing, mm. um, my mom took me to see within about two year period Andres Segovia mm. and also Car Carlos Montoya, mm. and then finally. Mani, Manitas de Plata, mm -hmm. who was a gypsy, is mm. a, a gypsy guitarist, absolutely mm. phenomenal, flamenco. Mm. Um, and it, it's been said that, well, he's a bit sloppy. Well, so what? You know, the fact is the it's emotion is so there. Mm. It's like, it, that's just unbelievable. Yeah. So those three guys, mm -hmm. Dwayne Eddy was a big influ influence, The mm. Ventures, mm. Um, some of the telly players, you know, mm. the Roy Buchanan's and those yeah, guys. Sure, yeah. Um, but geez, there's, there's always been so much to listen to. It's just a quest. It's a question of, you know, how plugged in you are to what's going on. Can your friends turn you on to other things? Mm. 